Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, All Hallows Eve. Glad that you are joining us today for this service of worship. For those of you watching either live right now or later on YouTube, welcome. Glad that you are joining us. Uh, a, uh, an email goes out each Sunday morning that has uh, a copy of the bulletin, including all the announcements, including the music. So those of you watching on YouTube, you can follow along with everything that's presented here uh, in the sanctuary. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Carrie and Alan White for the beautiful flowers. Uh, they are flowers in remembrance of Alan Kathy, Carrie's father, who would have been 88 years old today. And Alan died last October, and his family misses him greatly, so thank you for bringing those today. Uh, please note that uh, this is Stewardship Sunday, Emphasis Sunday, and that there will be a call congregational meeting, brief one, toward the close of today's service, and that uh, it, it's a special day for that. And also, this, of course, is the fifth Sunday. As you can tell when you walked in already, lots of folks have been bringing uh, uh, any number of items for our Afghan neighbor assistance. Uh, there's also tables set up in the Fellowship Hall where many people have brought items into Fellowship Hall as well. So um, please do that. It, it, even though we're collecting today, if you, any time, any Sunday, you want to bring items, please do so. There uh, will be more about that later in the service uh, with the new Afghan Neighbor Resource Survey, which I'll go ahead and mention now, by the way, is as a bulletin insert, it's also on the information table. Uh, it has the list of items we're needing, but it also has a, a survey of, of your level of interest and in how you might be able to help participate. So we ask that you uh, take a look at that. If you want to fill it out now, you can put it in the collection plate as you leave the service today. So that's our uh, very important uh, survey. And also, uh, it'll be then two weeks from today that we will be having our Commitment Sunday. Uh, next week I'll be in Dallas for nephew's wedding and the Reverend Gordon Edwards has graciously agreed to preach for us. So we're moving back Commitment Sunday one extra week until I'm back. Uh, you'll be receiving a letter this coming week that has the proposed budget for next year uh, as well as a pledge card and ask that you bring those back on November 14th. And uh, there's other bulletin announcement things, but those will be brought up during the service as well. With that then, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God as we listen to this morning's prayer. Mm -hmm.
please rise in body or in spirit for the call to worship. God's bountiful giving knows no ending. God has entrusted to us the variety of treasures. These many blessings are meant to be shared with others. Let us offer our very selves in gratitude to our generous God. In joy and thanksgiving, let us worship God. <clears throat> forgiving God, let us join together in our prayer of confession. God of God creation, who gives all that is good, we come this day in gratitude for you to have blessed our lives. You are the giver of every good and perfect gift. Remind us of our hopes and truths, heritages of all you have provided and trusted. steadfast love to recenter our lives. Let us acknowledge and receive the forgiveness God has already graciously offered. We rejoice in His goodness. Thanks be to God. Amen.
church, please come forward for a few moments. Look for your spot over here. He had some hymnals out from yesterday. Have a seat, you guys. Here we go. Wow, you guys are looking really awesome today. It looks like some of you have dressed up. How come? <laughs> Halloween? When is Halloween? Today. Yes, it is today. You have a witch costume? And I heard from you that this is your pre-Halloween outfit just for church, and you're gonna wear something different tonight for trick-or-treating. And you have some cool butterfly wings. Those are beautiful. So, and this is this is great. What's this for? Is that just your coat? It's just a jacket. Well, stand up and turn around. It look, I didn't mean it was a costume, but it's beautiful. <laughs> so, yes, sir. No, we're done talking about costumes. No. Um, what I wanted to talk about is where did Halloween come from, and why do we celebrate it? You, you know. We need some spooky times. Well, true. <laughs> you just looked it up. Well, so did I again this morning. Oh, go ahead, tell us. Speak up a little bit. You said to help ward off evil spirits? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, this is an interesting holiday. It's Halloween. Hallow, you know what we say in the Lord's Prayer? Our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do you know what that means? Hallowed means saint. So hallow means saint, and the end part, Halloween, means evening. So this is All Saints Eve, okay? And so a long time ago, even before Jesus, before Christianity, there were a group of people called the Celts, and we have our own Celtic circle here, and they had a season of the year that started on tomorrow. And this was to end the harvest season and to move into the winter season. And they felt that the, the, the distance between our world and the other world was thin during this time, and we could maybe perhaps talk to those who have passed away. Now that's not a particular Christian belief exactly that same way, but they used to have big bonfires and they used to dress up. But it was later, once Christianity came in, they added that day called All Saints Day, and that's tomorrow. And do you know what we do on All Saints Day? That's when we do remember those people in our lives that we know who have passed away. So it's a way of remembering the dead and the love that they had in our lives. So this is kind of like the big party before a more solemn occasion of, of, of remembering those who have gone before us. So that's a big complex understanding, right? And how trick or treating came in involved. They used to give gifts and stuff like that. So things kind of changed once it came here to America. But know that this holiday goes back over 2,000 years. So that's pretty amazing. So are you guys going to have fun tonight? Are you going to go trick-or-treating? Yes. The treat part means you get some treats. Yes, you do get some treats. Hopefully you won't be doing too many tricks. Yes, ma'am. Here you have pumpkins. You have pumpkins. See? You brought up the most wonderful thing. See the table here? Notice how it's all set up with pumpkins and with things from the fall. And that's to remind us of this time of year as well. And that's another reason why we have pumpkins around our houses. Now, when we started stabbing them with knives and turning them into scary faces, I don't, I don't know where jack o lanterns came from, but, but the, these are the, yeah, so that's why it's very important to decorate the table. Yeah, yellow pumpkin, that means it's not quite right. I guess, I don't know, yes. And you're going to have a Halloween party. 
Well, I want all of you to be very safe, okay? This is the first time you've come up, isn't it? Liam, hi, give me, give me a bomb. Thanks, buddy. Oh, that was so fun. Well, I think you might be getting a little treats when the, the time with the children in just a few seconds. It's so good to see so many of all of you. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we understand that this holiday is a very long and complex history, but we give you thanks that we can enjoy it and have fun. We can get together with friends and we can see neighbors. And that also that we remember tomorrow to pause and give thanks for all of those saints, all of those people in our lives who have passed away so we can remember them as well. So bless these children, keep them safe, keep children safe everywhere on this night especially. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next week or two weeks from now. Like last week at this time, we now have a moment for stewardship. And I'd like to invite uh, Tally Ferguson to come forward. Oh my gosh, is he looking dapper? <laughs> he must have known he was getting in front of all of you guys. And he's going to introduce a couple other folks today because we, last week we did uh, two different ministry teams, worship and music and building and grounds, giving you thanks for the contributions that helped them do their part of the ministry of the church. And now we will be expanding this week into personnel and outreach and missions. So Tally. Thank you, Reverend Todd, and, uh, and as you mentioned last week, we got to the stewardship committee decided this time to have the leaders that are portioning your time and talents uh, to speak with you. So the moderators have been sharing uh, the last week the, the tangible things that we see around us. Uh, this week, uh, Fred is going to lead off with the personnel, which manages the very most important asset that we have, it would be our leader and our staff. Um, and then Lori and Terry are going to close out uh, with how we move outward and how we leverage and turn our five bags of gold into ten outside of our community. So with that said, if you could come up and share about personnel too. Thank you, Tally. Uh, you're a hard act to follow, all dressed up like that. <laughs> Just don't show up at my house for trick-or-treats. <laughs> On behalf of the session, I'd like to thank you, the congregation, for your generous financial support, College Hill, that allows us to make our uh, budget a reality. Among other things, it allows us to uh, uh, continue to retain the best pastor and uh, staff members. Charles Stanford, our finance and stewardship moderator, has recently described these individuals as College Hill's most valuable asset. I totally agree. Since personnel and personnel related items uh, represent about 60% of uh, our uh, projected budget for this year. I thought it worthwhile to uh, mention uh, some of the major categories in my next two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> List under the pastor category, besides salary and housing is continuing education, pulpit supply, and the Easter Oklahoma Presbytery uh, dictated pension, major medical and dental insurance costs. Under, under other personnel category are listed the office manager, music and bell choir director, organists, child care workers, and a newly developed position, streaming and social media specialists, who will be responsible for producing our online services. Also, uh, FICA, Workman's Comp, and Payroll Processing is also listed in this area. 
The only budget uh, request that the personnel team is actually charged with is making salary increase recommendations uh, for Reverend Todd Freeman, Dr. Kim Childs, Mike Gibson, and Lisa Hayes. These figures are based on the Eastern Oklahoma Presbytery's uh, annual recommendations coupled with inflation data from government websites. These uh, recommendations are then uh, vetted by the finance and stewardship team along with other teams' budgets to uh, ensure that uh, College Hill resources are best utilized. The finance and stewardship team takes the stewardship and their name very seriously. So you can be confident that College Hill session will be good stewards of resources given you. Thank you. I, I, I now yield the floor to Terry Baxter and Lori Decker Wright, who will share information with you on outreach and mission programs. Thanks, Tally, for the invitation. I'm Lori Decker Wright. I'm not only a congregate member, but I'm the executive director of Kendall Whittier Incorporated. Um, I joined the staff in 2015, and that's how I met Reverend Todd and how I got to know College Hill and became a member in 2016. The work I do at Kendall Whittier Incorporated also motivated me to want to run for um, city council, and so I'm in my first year of the second term on the Tulsa City Council. Incorporate uh, Kendall Whittier Ministries in 1968 with a coalition of the neighborhood's churches to help address the needs of our most vulnerable neighbors. And we continue that work today as a standalone nonprofit 53 years later. Although our organization has focused on a variety of social needs during our five decades of service, for the last 20 years, we have been hyper focused on meeting the food security needs for our neighbors. In 2018, we expanded our service area beyond the boundaries of Kendall Whittier neighborhood to also include Crutchfield and the Pearl District. The primary way we address hunger is through our emergency food pantry. We also host three community gardens in Kendall Whittier neighborhood, the Grove Teaching Garden across from Educare, the Sequoia Elementary School on the north side of the neighborhood on the campus of TPS Sequoia Elementary School, and the Tipton Community Garden on East First Street between Zunas and Gillette, which operates as a traditional um, shared gardening model for mostly adults and families in the neighborhood and nearby neighborhoods. We partner with both elementary schools every winter to provide a holiday gift bag that includes nutritious snacks for the children to take home during the two weeks that they're on break. Five days a week, 52 weeks a year, through our emergency food pantry, Kendall Whittier Incorporated delivers a week's worth of nutritious groceries to, to feed everyone in the recipient household. We also connect those recipients to the additional services that we identify um, when their needs are greater than those that our organization serves directly. And we do this through the generous support of College Hill, local family foundations, as well as corporate and private donors. College Hill not only provides significant financial support of our programs, but also provides in-kind donations, at collecting shelf-stable food, as well as providing talent through the generous work of volunteers from our congregation. Whether it's serving on our board of directors or volunteering in our food pantry or gardens. As a founding member of our organization, College Hill has two designated seats on our board of directors, and our current representatives from the church are Jenny Fox and Tally Ferguson. Both are invaluable to our organization. <laughs> Kendall Whittier Incorporated is grateful for all the ways that College Hill enables us to meet our mission as a homegrown organization incorporating self-sufficiency for our neighbors through food security, nutritional health, and well-being. We operate on $160,000 annual, annually, <coughs> employing five part-time staff, including myself, our pantry director, a Hispanic liaison, a garden coordinator, and our administrator and bookkeeper. 
We could not meet our mission without the support of hundreds of volunteers like our friend Terry Baxter, who will share with you his insight uh, volunteering to assist us in our emergency food pantry. Terry. I have no accolades to talk about myself, so I'll just tell you what, what I do with the food pantry. Uh, Barry and I each week go to the food pantry. Sometimes we pack groceries. Most of the times we just deliver groceries. Uh, sometimes we do both. Uh, essentially, it's, it's like uh, being at a grocery store. You fill the bags with the things that uh, a person would need for, for their size family. We have guidelines for the different amounts of people. And then we take those bags directly to their home. And during COVID, we just kind of put them on the door like the Easter Bunny and run away. But <laughs> normally, we, we visit with them and, 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 and get to know them a little bit. One of the things that it is, Barry has remarked with me about is that it helps us maintain our contact with people who are not as lucky as we are. And I think that's something that's very important with any kind of voluntary service, is it puts you out there where the people who have the needs are. And we appreciate the support of College Hill, and all we ask is when you bring your chef sable food, check the dates on it before you go. <laughs> Thank you.
with great thanks to God for the sharing of your time and talent with us. That is beyond words of beauty. And after giving a, a moment for stewardship and a solo, just wondering if you would not like to give a sermon. <laughs> she knows where her talent is. Okay. <laughs> The signed uh, lectionary gospel passage for this Sunday comes from, again, Mark 10. Uh, this will be the third time preaching from Mark 10, and I'll refer to the other two times during the sermon. But uh, hear these words. It's the story that we know of the healing of blind Bartimaeus. They, meaning Jesus and his disciples, came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, and by the way, they were heading up to Jerusalem for Jesus' triumphal entry in what would be the last week of his life with his arrest and crucifixion. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. Menly sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word. Amen. Well, in today's epistle reading, which we heard a bit earlier from Galatians 6, the Apostle Paul writes to that Christian community of faith, God is not mocked. You shall reap whatever you sow. Now, there's a great teaching about good stewardship. And I have used that passage on several previous occasions on Stewardship Emphasis Sunday. But I decided not to preach on that today because it was just too easy. Instead, I felt challenged to find some kind of message about good stewardship from today's Gospel reading from Mark 10, the story of blind Bartimaeus. Now, some of you may remember a sermon from just three weeks ago entitled The Ethics of Finances. It was kind of like a stewardship primer. And that sermon came from this same chapter in Mark about a rich young man who decided not to follow Jesus because he had many possessions of which he did not want to give away to help the poor and the needy. But as we all know, or should know, good stewardship is more than just the sharing of our finances to further the work and ministry of God. It's also about sharing our time and our talent. And as we'll see, there is a strong connection between these two stories in Mark 10 because they both address the issue of discipleship, following the ways and teachings of Jesus. But I want to start with something often overlooked in this story, the actual name of the man who was healed. Rarely in the Gospels is a name given to someone who was healed by Jesus. But here we are given the name of the blind beggar. And by the way, that's basically a redundant set of words. If persons in that ancient culture were blind, then most likely they indeed lived the life of a beggar. But Mark provides the name Bartimaeus, 
So this must be important for some reason. The easy answer from a literal standpoint is that this person just was an actual historical figure and this just happened to be his name. But there are other possibilities, however, like Mark intentionally choosing this name for its metaphorical meaning. Bartimaeus, which even as the biblical text explains, means son of Timaeus. Bar means son. And the root word for Timaeus has a couple of different possible meanings. The ambiguity itself may have been intentional on the part of the Gospel writer, as is commonly done by the author of the Gospel of John. And the translation of the root of the Greek-derived name Timaeus means honor. Therefore, it's possible to translate Bartimaeus as son of honor. But there's an alternative root word from the Aramaic language, the language of which Jesus spoke, which means something very different. It implies unclean or impure. In this case, Bartimaeus could mean son of the unclean. This would be in keeping with the general bigotry and bias against those with disabilities which was commonly thought to be an inherited trait because of the sins of the parents. But now what does any of this name study have to do with stewardship? Well, we already know that Bartimaeus, because of his blindness, was on the fringe of society. And the interpretation of his name as son of the unclean adds to this reality of being an outsider. And Mark adds to this by adding that Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside, another sign of his exclusion. His crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, applies the messianic term to Jesus. So perhaps Mark's point is that the son of David chooses to engage with the son of the unclean. Even though the disciples tell the man to be quiet and leave Jesus out of this. If one goes with the interpretation of the son of honor, then Jesus' interaction with this person at the fringe of society brings him out of that condition to one of honor. Now, both understandings of this name contribute to the impact of this story. Jesus hears Bartimaeus call out to him, and he asks, what do you want me to do for you? By the way, that is the exact same question that Jesus previously asked of James and John before they ambitiously replied that they want Jesus to let them sit at the right and left side of Jesus in his glory. <clears throat> they saw power privilege, status, and authority. And I preached on that passage two weeks ago, in which Jesus turns their request into a teaching about lording it over others and a proper understanding of discipleship. As a follower of Jesus, to serve, not to be served. See how these three stories are reading together. This, we will see, is meant by Mark to contrast with Bartimaeus's request and response, of which we'll look at. Now, concerning Bartimaeus, Jill Duffield, former uh, editor of Presbyterian Outlook, commented, Jesus offers the dignity of asking someone long silenced and on, uh, long sidelined and silenced to speak for himself to have his voice heard, honored, and tended. And when countless people sternly order Bartimaeus to be quiet, not to make a scene, don't disrupt, accept your fate, Jesus stops, calls for him, and asks, what do you want? Jesus listens, 
and gives Bartimaeus that for which he asks. And he requires nothing in return. Jesus simply tells him, go. Your faith has made you well. Now this has spiritual connotations as well as physical ones. For Bartimaeus, once healed, does not follow Jesus' instructions to go. Instead, we're told that he followed Jesus on the way. Now historically, at first the followers of Jesus were not called Christians. They were called people of the way. Bartimaeus becomes a follower of Jesus and therefore engages in active discipleship as his response of gratitude to the grace of God. And that is the key. Theological and practical understandings of good stewardship are almost always tied to our response of gratitude to God's grace in our lives. Imagine if Jesus' disciples, the church, Christ's body, this congregation, you and me, responded likewise to the marginalized, silenced, suffering, and vulnerable. Like in this story, every blind beggar, every outsider, though still considered to be unclean, has a name and a family and a place, and a history, their own story. Therefore, when someone cries out for help, at the very least, we ought not order them to be silent, as did Jesus' misunderstanding disciples. As followers of the ways and teachings of Jesus, we, like him, must honor and acknowledge the pain and hurt of those made in the image of God. God does desire abundant life for all people. Not a false peace for those of us with the ability to cross to the other side of the street or to roll up our car windows and lock our doors. Perhaps the most Christ-like response is to stop and see and hear and attend to the person that you and I too often see as a mere interruption. In the story, again, Jesus asks Bartimaeus what he wants. We learn from that 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 is a very good precedent that we too should follow. Too often, we good-intentioned church folks often presume to know what other people want. Only later do we learn that perhaps we shouldn't have presumed to know best what other people need. And there's often a white savior mentality that accompanies us into the ministry field. Whether it be in Nicaragua or in North Tulsa or in any area of suffering from a natural disaster or a stranger who approaches us on the street. Bartimaeus asked Jesus for what? The ability to see, which is almost always used in the Gospels as a metaphor for spiritual sight, not just physical sight. So this should cause us to pause, to look at ourselves in the mirror and ask if there is anything to which we are blind. Our culture is filled with things which can distract and blind us. Perhaps contributing factors include consumerism, information overload, self-gratification, white privilege, and color blindness. We're told that after Jesus called Bartimaeus to come to him, Bartimaeus threw off his cloak and went to Jesus. Mark most likely means this metaphorically as well. Throwing away one's cloak, which is probably his only possession, can mean leaving behind the old order of things. It can mean throwing off an old way of life. 
Again, that's something that the rich young man, because of his attachment to his possessions, was not able to do. So let me ask, are there cloaks that you and I and we here at College Hill need to throw off? Throw aside. And as previously mentioned, this story is meant to contrast with the one of James and John asking Jesus for power and privilege. Again, we see this consummate outsider outshine the insiders. Thus, he becomes an actual model of discipleship for us. As Duffield notes, this is important. Jesus gave Bartimaeus that for which he asked with nothing required in return. This is no transaction, no quid pro quo. There is no gratitude or deference expected. Jesus freely gives. And Bartimaeus is free to respond as he is moved. So Jesus says, go. But instead, his response of gratitude, Bartimaeus chooses to follow Jesus on the way, the way of discipleship. So how well are we following Jesus on the way? But well, yes, offering the opportunity for you and I to give of our time and talents and financial resources to the church does indeed help to maintain our building and grounds, have a vibrant music program, meaningful children's ministries, offer services of worship and education and hopefully soon fellowship, and certainly to employ professional staff. But it also makes it possible as a congregation to reach out and to listen and to minister to folks like Bartimaeus through vital outreach and mission programs. So, so many more than were mentioned here today, such as we are doing today with the collecting of necessary goods to help the transition of our new Afghan neighbors here in Tulsa. So whether we engage with someone who society deems as on the fringe or unclean, or as someone who has been bestowed with respect and honor, our annual budget becomes a spiritual document. It declares to ourselves and to the public our priorities and our efforts to be good stewards, to follow Jesus on the way. For it is in the freely giving of ourselves that demonstrates the mark of our Christian commitment and discipleship. Amen.
In gratitude to God, let us gather our pledges and offerings. And our collection plates are located just inside the sanctuary doors. You can drop your check off before or after the service, or you can mail it in. We lift up to you, O oh God, the names of those that we have lost from this community of faith since All Saints Day last year, knowing that they are indeed in your loving and eternal presence. As we read these names, we pause after each so that we can remember, pray, and give thanks for their life and love. Linda Watts. And Nancy Vanderberg.
We celebrate the lives of those we have named, O God, and lift up now silently many more names. Those who have passed, we remember in our hearts. To those who have passed, we remember you, and we honor you, and we know you are with us in the spirit of worship, and you will not be forgotten. O oh God, we give you thanks for all that you have done and who have joined us with your sacred presence beyond this life. We know that in our grief and loss and celebration and life, you are with us through it all, and we are not left alone. For those who have gone before us, O oh God, seeds planted in your rich pasture with the hope of life eternal, may their enduring spirit live on, enriching and empowering our lives. For their love lingers, and their presence is near. In the name of Christ, in whom love lives forever, we pray. And hear us now as we pray together, saying, Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. to those in need. We will do 
use our time, talents, and resources to further the realm of God. And now I would like to ask you to please be seated for our brief congregational meeting for the purpose of electing a new class of ruling elders and a congregation member for our nominating committee. Um, and if any of you who are not uh, church members don't want to hang around for this, you're free to go, but this won't last long. Um, it is my understanding that the moderator of our nominating committee uh, is not able to be here, Clay Fink Ward, so I will present his report. But first, um, let us begin with a word of prayer. Loving and gracious God, every year at this time we are blessed with the understanding of how we as Presbyterians choose to govern ourselves. And that is through the election of ruling elders to serve on the session to help serve this congregation and you. So we bring before us this day a new class and we ask for your blessing upon these proceedings at this time. Fill us with wisdom, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Kathy Brandon, our clerk of session, is right there. And Madam Clerk, uh, do we have a quorum? Yes, we do. As I ask every year, Margaret, you can't answer because you always know the answer before everybody else. What's the percentage of a congregational quorum? Very good. So we have more than enough so that so we can proceed. Let me give the report from the nominating committee. For the cl early class of 2020, Betsy Geyer, if you are here, please stand. Her I, in fact, she's in Lincoln, Nebraska right now. Her father, who we've met many times before here in this sanctuary, uh, is now just went on hospice. And she's visiting other relatives before coming back um, for what may be his transition in life. So Betsy Geyer and Bill Major, some of you may know him. <laughs> Emily Oldham, who I understand is at home with a sick daughter, Ruby. Okay, Bill, why'd you show up? <laughs> um, and because the, the, the next one's not here either. This has to do with, again, the, the, once we get children vaccinated, there will be more of these families being uh, feeling comfortable coming back, and that is Price Purvis, who um, is a fairly new member, actually uh, longer than you think. He was uh, brought into church membership the week before we closed down in March of last year. So he has yet to be presented and his family and some others to the congregation. So that is our class uh, that comes from the nominating committee, uh, as is our polity. The floor is open if there are additional nominations. Hearing none, are you ready to proceed to the vote? Yes. All in favor of electing Betsy Geyer, Bill Major, Emily Oldham, and Price Purvis to serve as ruling elders for the class of 2020, give a hearty amen. Amen. And let's give them a thank you for agreeing to serve. And uh, every year we replace one of the congregation members. There are a couple members of session on the nominating committee and three members of the congregation on the nominating committee. And uh, our, we needed a replacement for this year's term. And that from the nominating uh, committee is uh, Donna Wood. Donna, would you stand up? Hi, Donna. Most people know Donna very well as well. Um, it, you know what? I don't think we can take nominations for the floor on this. Can we? Okay, let's do it. Gordon? Yeah, that's what I thought. Any other nominations for serving on the nominating committee? Because I know about Donna. No? Okay. If there are no objections, then we will proceed to the vote. All in favor of electing Donna Wood to serve on our nominating committee say amen. Amen. Thank you, Donna, for really doing the show. 
That closes our congregational meeting. I will close in prayer, but I'd like to ask if you please stay seated, as is now our new tradition um, for the post of, let us pray. God of love and grace, we give you thanks for your call to good stewardship, your call to ministry, your call to leadership and discipleship. We give you thanks for the gifts that you have blessed Betsy, Bill, Emily, Price, and Donna with, that they bring to the leading of this magnificent congregation of which you have so richly blessed. So bless them and bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.